Oral questions. Question orale, l'honorable député de... The honorable member for Louis Saint-Laurent. Mr. Speaker, the role of the Prime Minister is to unite Canadians, especially in a crisis as we are going through right now. But on the contrary, the Prime Minister is showing just how arrogant he is with regard to the provinces. Instead of bringing everyone together, he's giving lessons in a way that is irresponsible and disrespectful. Yesterday, the Prime Minister of Canada gave lessons to the Premier of Quebec. Insulting the Premier means insulting Quebecers. Why? Is the Canadian Prime Minister being so irresponsible, the Honourable Member? Mr. Speaker, when you look at the speech from the throne, which is an excellent one, and which includes, for instance, daycare, Quebec already has its daycare system. Of course, we take that into account. And in fact, it it's a model for us for other provinces, and Quebec will get its fair share through negotiations. That's clear. The other point my friend has referred to is seniors. Seniors don't belong to any jurisdiction. They are people who have suffered more than anyone else during the pandemic. The Honourable Member. Well, that's right, Mr. Speaker. Since Quebec has its daycare system, why? Because this falls under provincial jurisdiction. It's up to the provinces to decide. The federal government should not dictate to the provinces what to do. Yesterday, when I asked the Prime Minister questions about Western Canada and why Western Canadians are so upset, he said, that's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Mr. Speaker, not only has he uh, offended Quebecers, but also Western Canadians. Why is the Canadian Prime Minister being so irresponsible towards all Canadians. Mr. Speaker, the speech from the throne contains very positive things for all Canadians. When you read the speech from the throne and you go through all of its elements, it's clear that we are in a pandemic and it is the priority of the government is to protect the health and safety of all Canadians. So I would like to reach out to my friend and I would ask him, instead of fighting over jurisdictions or just generally fighting, let's work together, Mr. Speaker, to help our seniors, to help our businesses, and to help those who have lost their jobs. Let's do all of this together. The Honourable Member uh, for Louis Saint Laurent. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the government tabled a piece of uh, legislature a few days ago, Bill C2, and uh, obviously we want to work correctly on that. We made a proposition a few hours ago with our all counterparts here to be sure to work correctly. We mean to have a sitting house here for a committee on the whole this Sunday. Is the government is ready to work on Sunday for the good and wealth of the future of the Canadians? The Honourable Minister. The government is, is working seven days a week for Canadians. The government's working all the time for Canadians, Mr. Speaker. We'll, we'll analyze what my colleague has offered, and you know, through discussions, we can get to do, do it a lot of things. And that's why we insisted so much to be able to be here and also present virtually, so all MPs could participate. And I'm glad that they agree that they finally agree, Mr. Speaker. We can do a lot of things together with goodwill. Honourable member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Yesterday, the Minister of Health said, quote, that she would rely on the expertise of researchers, scientists, and experts to guide us on the matter of rapid testing. But experts, researchers, and scientists in other developed countries have already approved rapid and at-home testing. So this begs the question, if we're collaborating with these experts, researchers, and scientists on things like a vaccine, why can't we use it for rapid testing? When will the review of rapid testing be complete in Canada? The Honourable Minister. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the question. And I obviously share the members' uh, deep desire to have more sophisticated tools to be able to respond to COVID-19, including more sophisticated testing capacity. Of course, there's not one single rapid test solution, and testing is a complex space. But I will tell you what I do know. We need to rely on Canadian regulators who will tell us when a test is safe enough and accurate enough to be released into Canadian society, because, of course, tests that don't provide accurate response could make situations way worse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Well, member for Calgary Nose Hill. The minister needs to realize there are people waiting for eight to ten days to get their results. And it's her job to go into her department and say, hey, What's taking so long? Here, here. Why can't we do this quick, quickly and fulsomely? Make it happen. It's not enough to share a desire, Mr. Speaker. She is in charge of this. She's got to go read her riot, read the riot act to her bureaucrats and get this done. When will the review be complete? Here, here. Here, here. Honourable Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Unlike the member opposite, I'm incredibly grateful to the bureaucrats, as she calls them, the researchers, the scientists, the civil service, who has uh, We're on mute. We haven't heard anything. The Honourable Minister, if she can check her connection. De la Prairie. The auto member for La Prairie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, we saw just how con condescending the Prime Minister was. Who does he think he is to give lessons to Quebec with regard to the presence of armed forces in long-term care forums? Quebec taxpayers, in fact, pay for the armed forces. Why are we in this situation today? Because for 25 years, the federal government has made cuts to health care. They're the ones who are at fault not the government of Quebec. If the federal government had listened to Quebecers, experts, or common sense, they would have invested in health care. Instead of giving lessons, why is this government not increasing health care transfers? Before continuing, I would like to remind members, and uh, I know that uh, we've only just started our work again. Please refer to members by their writings, not their names. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, my colleague is trying to create dissent between Quebec and Ottawa. I, I said so yesterday, and I still maintain, and I say this from the bottom of my heart, Mr. Speaker. Our seniors are not aligned in the Constitution. They are not a jurisdiction. These are flesh and bones human beings who have suffered more than anyone else in this pandemic, and we will be there for them. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the government uh, uh, has missed something. What was disdainful yesterday was not the Quebec government or anyone else. It was the federal prime minister who was trying to give less lessons to others. He talked about a blank check. Well, he gave a $900 million uh, blank check to his we charity friends. That's writing a blank check. Uh, will they increase health care transfers, yes or no? The honorable minister. Mr. Speaker, we've made significant investments in health care. We will keep on making those investments, be it in Quebec or elsewhere in Canada. However, here we are specifically talking about national standards, and we're talking about a dialogue we want to have with the provinces. We want to share common objectives. Of course, the provinces manage their own health care sectors, but it is extremely hurtful to reduce seniors to a jurisdictional issue. They are human beings. They have a right to health care dignity and good, um, good health care services. Merci, Monsieur. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. We decided to prorogue government. And in doing so, had almost two months to plan for a second wave, which we knew was coming. Now we're in the second wave. And this government has really no plan to deal with the crucial questions that people are faced with right now. What is this government doing to ensure people have access to testing? What are they doing to make sure people who need childcare have access to it? And what are they doing to make sure that our seniors, those who were ground zero for COVID-19, are protected? And finally, how is this government going to ensure that it's not everyday families that pay the price for the recovery, but it's those who have profited off this pandemic who pay the price. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And um, 
I uh, certainly uh, apologize for losing connection during the last question. Uh, to the member opposite, as the member knows, we have been there every step of the way with Canadians, with provinces, with territories, in fact, with local communities to make sure that we have a robust response to COVID-19, that we can together work to protect and save lives of Canadians. We will continue to wor that work in collaboration with all levels of government, with indeed Canadians, because that's how we will get through this together. Member for Burnaby South. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Because of the fact the, that the Liberal government and the Prime Minister shut down Parliament, they had almost two months to plan their response to a second wave. Well, now we're in the second wave. But what's the plan? What's the plan to address the issues which still are not fixed? For instance, testing, long-term health care, and senior care. What is the plan the federal government has to uh, ensure that uh, there is no profiting from this pandemic? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the question. We have worked very hard with the provinces and the territories and with local governments incredibly hard with all levels of government and indeed with Canadians to ensure that we can respond to COVID-19 together no matter what the virus throws at us. Mr. Speaker, this is a rapidly evolving situation, as you know, and of course the tools and the knowledge to defeat COVID-19 continue to evolve and we will be there, Mr. Speaker, for Canadians and for communities no matter what COVID-19 throws at us. Member for Carleton. I rise today to report a million missing paychecks. That's the number of people who've lost their jobs since February and have not been hired back. We have the highest unemployment of the G7. The US, UK, France, Italy, Japan, Germany, they all had COVID too, but they have lower unemployment than we do. Mr. Speaker, when will this government recognize that their plan to impose austerity on private sector mines and small businesses is not working? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the economic support we have been providing to Canadians during the pandemic has not only prevented a great deal of human misery, it is also driving our economic recovery. And you don't need to take my word for it. I quote, Federal government income support programs have so far been paramount for averting the delinquency tsunami and protecting the economy. TD economist Ksenia Bushman. For member for Carlton. Oh yes, the bankers are very happy. Yeah. They're making all kinds of money these days, Mr. Speaker. But you know who's not happy? The million working class people who no longer have jobs. Yes. Who had to go come home and sit at the kitchen table with their spouse and say, honey, I no longer have work or a paycheck, and I don't know what we're going to do. No government program can replace the mighty force of our 20 million workers, the power of a paycheck. When will this government get out of the way and let our workers get back into jobs? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me remind the member for Carleton and all Canadians what he said on March 8th when asked about what support the government should offer to those very Canadians hurt by the pandemic. I quote, you may want to address COVID-19 with big, fat government programs. We're Conservatives. We don't believe in that. Our government chose to support Canadians, and we are proud of it. I hate to imagine what the Conservatives would have done had they been elected in 2020. The member for Carlton. Well, there you go. They believe that big, fat government programs can replace the dignity and productivity of a job. Everyday Canadians actually want the opportunity to work. That is the only thing that will permanently put food on the table and provide the wealth necessary social safety net. This government has the worst jobs record in the G7. One third higher unemployment than across the OECD. Wow. When will they acknowledge that their plan is just not working? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, what the Honourable Member seems to 
maybe just not understand is that in fighting this pandemic, we have asked Canadians to make a really big sacrifice. We have asked Canadians to stay home. And you know what? We are still asking Canadians to practice social distancing because the best economic policy is to crush coronavirus. And to make it possible for Canadians to do that, our government is there for them, and we will be. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, here's a good one from this morning. The Prime Minister signed an agreement to find a vaccine with the Canada uh, for the CNRC and CanSec Bio, but the Chinese government simply cancelled the contract. We know that the Prime Minister really likes the Chinese communi communist regime, but Canadians want to know how many millions of dollars were lost to the Chinese, the Honourable Minister. Our government has been working closely with experts and industry partners throughout this pandemic, which has allowed us to make an evidence-based approach to vaccine research and development. In the context of our continued research and evolving evidence, the National Research Council chose to implement the revised expert advice of the Vaccine Task Force and pursue other vaccine candidates. We will continue to actively pursue every promising option for a COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute saint charles that, that answer is not satisfactory. Canada signed an agreement with the Chinese state uh, organization, Can Sino Bio. The Chinese cancelled the deal. It cost us money, but worse than that, the Canadian patents were transferred to China, and we still don't understand. And it seems that the government has forgotten that our two Michaels are still prisoners there, and that uh, Chinese really doesn't care about Canadian interests. So what does the Prime Minister think about this whole situation, and how can Canada's intellectual property, how could that end up in Chinese hands when they don't respect us? Speaker, and I welcome that question because, as everyone in this House knows, Canada has a complex and multi-dimensional relationship with China. Canada engages with China with our eyes wide open. Many of our international partners are facing similar challenges. We actively engage with them constantly to ensure that Canadian interests are upheld, human rights are spoken about, intellectual property is protected. Our government has been clear about our principles, our commitment to the rule of law, our deep concern for our citizens, including Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver, arbitrarily detained, and our farmers and producers in Canada who seek markets. Canada will remain firm and resolute. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint-Charles. Thank you for this diplomatic answer. But at the end of the day, our patents were stolen. We've lost millions of dollars. We trusted the Chinese when we know we cannot trust them. That's pretty clear. Yesterday, I asked other questions with regard to committees here in Canada, things we normally control, the Committee on Vaccines and uh, the Committee on COVID-19. We learned that uh, a member of the vaccine group uh, quit the group because he felt there was a lack of transparency. The other committee, the Committee on COVID-19, can we confirm there is no conflict of interest on the part of members of that particular committee? Mr. Speaker, allow me to thank my colleague for the question. Unlike the Conservatives who defunded science, our government greatly values the work of top scientific and industry experts who are volunteering their time to help ensure sound evidence-based decisions. But let me be very, very clear. The Vaccine Task Force has a robust conflict of interest process in place, which embodies international best practices, includes an online registry of declared interests and is consistent with the practices of other volunteer external advisory bodies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Manicouaga. Mr. Speaker, Ottawa does not want to sign a blank check. Ottawa says we have the expertise. Expertise in healthcare? Ottawa? Is that a joke? Ask the First Nations who don't have access to drinking water. Ask our veterans 
who've been abandoned by the system. The only expertise Ottawa has in healthcare is its ability to cause problems. We are on the cusp of the second wave. People will get sick, people will die. Please, enough of the expertise, just send us the money. What are they waiting for? The Honourable Minister. Monsieur, Monsieur le... Mr. Speaker, again, our friends from the Bloc Québécois are looking for fights, for battles. They're, they're comparing what Ottawa is doing, what Quebec is doing, what the other provinces are doing. Well, the fight against COVID, it's not, it's not a battle of one person or one group. It's the battle of everyone together, all of us parliamentarians, different governments, all of our cities and towns. That is what the Bloc does not want to recognize, because the Bloc don't like peace. But we'll keep on working together. We can do it. The Honourable Member for Manicouaga. Mr. Speaker, Ottawa should mind its own business before sticking its nose into others, other people's business. Quebec and the provinces are not responsible for the spread of the virus. There were no tests in airports or at the borders and no follow-ups. Ottawa did nothing, and yet it should have. That was its responsibility. Another federal responsibility, which has not been fulfilled, is the transfer of funds for health care so that Quebec and the provinces can, can keep on fighting this pandemic. Well, they finally now increase health care transfers. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, a little earlier, I was looking at, in the statutes and regulations of the Bloc Québécois. The first one says that the Bloc Québécois is, an in, is a sovereignist party. It wants independence. So I'm just wondering whether there's a connection between that and the fact that they're always criticizing Ottawa. They're blaming Ottawa for everything, regardless of what we do. We help Quebec in health care. We send in the Red Cross. Well, it's always Ottawa's fault, Mr. Speaker when we know that different levels of government can work together. They have worked together, and they will continue to work together. The Honourable Member for Richemont, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government has literally draped itself into a nice speech, but has done nothing for Francophones, so it's not surprising that it gave a billion-dollar contract, sole-source contract, to We Charity, which is a unilingual Anglophone organization. And yet, it's not complicated. Everybody simply wants the Official Languages Act to be modernized. So can the Minister for the Official Languages tell us when she will finally table a bill, as is called for by all organizations defending Francophone rights in this country? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to congratulate my colleague for um, his new responsibility for official languages, and I'd be very pleased to let him know everything Conservatives have done against official languages, because it's been five years that we've been trying to fix the problems caused by the Conservatives, name, namely the Francophone University in Ontario and the Legal Challenges Program. That said, I'm happy to work with him to strengthen the Official Languages Act, and I'm looking forward to further discussions with him. The Honourable Member for Richemont, Artabasca. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to remind the Minister that, in reality, they've been in power for five years and that nothing has been done. A few weeks ago, just recently, this Liberal government including the minister, there was a um, call. Uh, they awarded a sole source contract to their We Charity friends when we all know, and it's been documented, that they are unable to, that this organization does not operate in French. So we're talking about the We Charity scandal, which the government is trying to squash. So again, when will this minister table a bill which everyone is calling for? The Honourable Minister. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that we are cleaning up the mess the Conservatives have left us with regard to official languages. We're not only cleaning up the mess at the federal level, but also the mess at the 
provincial level, including the mess left behind by Doug Ford. Now, Jason Kenney is, in fact, undermining francophones in his province with the Saint-Jean campus. So will my colleague join me and denounce the cuts Jason Kenney is making, which will disadvantage francophones and the Saint-Jean campus? Mr. Speaker, long before COVID-19, the Liberals promised to put people first by investing in public transit. Nowhere is the need greater than the Young Subway extension. With 1.2 million residents and over 636,000 jobs, York Region is one of Canada's largest municipalities, but still has no Young Subway. This is the top priority for the residents in my riding and for all of York Region, but the Liberals aren't listening. When will this government deliver critical infrastructure funds for the Young Subway extension? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have a bilateral agreement with Ontario that sees the federal government investing a historic $11.8 billion in Ontario over the next de decade, including $8.3 billion for public transit. We need to be working with the government of Ontario and with local governments, and we've asked the government of Ontario to submit business cases on their major GTA transit lines, including the Premier's preferred Ontario line, so that we can actually move forward and expedite funding decisions. Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. And yet the Ontario government has already committed to the funding for the Young Subway extension. The Young Subway extension would create over 60,000 jobs and enable housing for 88,000 residents. It would drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions by taking over 3,000 buses a day off the streets. York Region keeps asking, but this government remains silent. When will this government create jobs and protect the environment and fund the Young Subway extension? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's always nice to hear Conservatives talk about the importance of protecting the environment. That is a top priority for us, and that's why we're investing in public transit. I would certainly encourage the Government of Ontario to bring a business case for it, because I know how much Conservatives care about taxpayer dollars, so we need to actually have the details so that we can move forward on an important project that will create jobs, that will reduce congestion, and that will improve the lives of people in Ontario. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Speaker, we know that women's careers have been the hardest hit by this pandemic, which has been made worse by the Liberals' failure to follow through on their promises for a universal child care program they first promised in 1993. Mr. Speaker, I am not going to hold my breath. Will the Minister tell us the implementation timeline for a universal child care program that properly supports early childhood educators, cares for kids with exceptional needs, and helps parents who want to go back to work outside the home confidently go back to work? The Honourable Minister. Parliamentary Secretary in this case, but uh, thank you very much. We have made the largest single-year investment in early learning and child care in the history of this country this year through this pandemic with a $625 million investment to help get child care spaces secured, expanded, and, and made safe for families right across the country. That's before the throne speech. The throne speech is now committed to a new national program. We look forward to the NDP supporting it and not defeating a government like they did back in 2006. But the critical issue now is to sit down with the provinces and expand the system, protect quality, and make sure that child care workers are paid properly. That's the work we're engaged in. That's the work we'll continue to move forward on. The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, the new Chalath on the West Coast to the Mi'kmaq on the East Coast the Liberals have spent millions on lawyers to fight Indigenous fishing rights. And time and time again, the courts have upheld Indigenous fishing rights. Now the lawyers, the Liberals, are talking out of both sides of their mouths. But by trying to play both sides, they're leaving DFO officials without a clear mandate. And they're putting lives at risk. Shame. Will the Minister finally back up her claims that she supports self-determination by actually upholding inherent and constitutionally protected rights? Yeah. The Honourable Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, right now the government's number one priority is making sure people stay safe in southwest Nova Scotia, where the tensions are quite high. We are working with our First Nations leadership as well as with the industry partners in Nova Scotia. We believe that the best way forward is through respectful and collaborative dialogue. We are working to make sure that we uphold those treaty rights. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Brome, Mississauga. Mr. Speaker, as I'm always in contact with the people and the entrepreneurs of Brome, Mississauga, I was able to see their solidarity and resilience during this pandemic. As we move towards an economic recovery, our people are asking for one thing, the creation of better jobs and more investment in infrastructure. Now we're looking toward the future. Can the Minister of Infrastructure and Communities give an update on her work to help communities? Ministre. The Honourable Minister. I'd like to thank the member for Brome, Mississauga for this question. Every dollar that the government will invest will be to create good jobs and to improve the quality of life of our communities. And that is why the federal government is investing in the renewal of water ducts in that riding. And they will receive more than $5 million from the Green Infrastructure Fund to improve the quality of life and the resiliency of these people. Permission, Maskey, Fraser Canyon. Mr. Speaker, when the pandemic hit, financial institutions granted six-month mortgage deferrals to ensure Canadians wouldn't lose their homes. By the end of June, more than 760,000 Canadians used these programs. Next week, those deferral programs end and mortgage payments are due. Economists suggest that 5% of mortgages could default. That's almost 40,000 homes. Mortgages weren't referenced in the throne speech. Mr. Speaker, why is the Liberal government okay with potentially thousands of Canadians losing their homes? Are we not in a second wave? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much for that important question. Mr. Speaker, our government is absolutely committed to supporting Canadians and Canadian businesses throughout this crisis. The mortgage deferrals from our banks have indeed been very, very helpful to many Canadian families, and this is an issue that we are going to continue to be working on. I also want to point out that the extensive support we have provided to individual Canadians and to Canadian small businesses has helped Canadians get through so far. As we said in the throne speech, we are committed to continuing to be there for Canadians as we fight, as the member opposite points out quite rightly, this second wave. The Honourable Member for Mission Matsky fraser Canyon. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals' National Housing Co-Investment Fund was announced with great fanfare in 2017, but over the two to three year period has delivered very little nationwide. Now they want us to believe they can build 3,000 homes in six months. Right. Will the government commit, here and now, to operate with transparency and provide a running list of projects as they are allocated funding with regional breakdowns unlike the opaque approach to the National Housing Co-Investment Fund? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Rapid Housing Initiative announced this week with a billion dollar investment in acquisition and construction of new supportive housing units is one of the most important investments I think this government and this in fact this country has ever made in terms of in terms of battling chronic homelessness. The throne speech now commits to ending chronic homelessness in this country and that is an ambitious but a massively necessary target. The issue that the member opposite raises uh, is, is an important one. We need to show Canadians exactly where these units are landing and how people are being helped and we'll commit to work to make sure he gets the information he needs. I would caution him though not to rely on some of the language coming out of newspaper articles. The investments in BC are 26.8% of the investments we've made. I've made several announcements of projects in BC and that's a good news story for The Honourable Member for Desnete, Mississippi, Churchill River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. During the pandemic, I've heard many stories of how this government has left out or left behind Indigenous businesses. Seba and Seuss are just two examples. Last week, I attended a recovery forum hosted by the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. Many there expressed frustration, resulting from the government's failure to meet a target of 5% procurement for Indigenous-owned businesses. When will this government allow Indigenous entrepreneurs to share in Canada's prosperity? Honourable Minister.
sorry, Mr. Honorable. Speaker, I was having trouble unmuting my uh, my microphone. Um, Mr. Speaker, we recognize Indigenous businesses and their communities face unique challenges and have been disproportionately impacted by the current situation. That's why we took action to support Indigenous business to respond to the hardships that have been amplified by COVID-19. This includes investing $423.8 million to support local businesses and ensure business owners have access to the support they need to get through this challenging time. With this support, Indigenous communities and businesses will have the flexibility they need to respond to their unique economic needs through this difficult time. The Honourable Member for Kenora. Mr. Speaker, the government's throne speech was short on details for the North. Many Canadians in my riding across the territories and in other parts of Northern Canada struggle with housing shortages, transportation difficulties, and higher costs of goods and services. The North needs serious upgrades to infrastructure and transportation routes to ensure food security and lower the cost of living. Will the government finally step up and commit to those critical investments, or will they continue to leave Northern Canada behind? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of the support we've given uh, Northern Canada during these difficult times. In April, we've uh, invested $130 million for economic and, uh, and health uh, uh, supports for all of Northern Canada. We've also uh, invested significantly in aviation uh, support. So uh, uh, through these difficult times, our government will be there for the entire uh, for all Canadians, uh, including, of course, Canadians who live in the North. The Honourable Member for Joliet. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The federal government has fallen asleep at the wheel. The enemy to beat right now isn't Quebec or the provinces or the opposition parties. It's COVID-19. That's the priority and the only priority. It's managing this public health crisis. By refusing to increase health transfers, they alone are creating a political crisis instead of remedying a health crisis. When are they going to wake up? Health transfers must increase now. The Honourable Minister, thank you very much. Today in Quebec, we have 637 new cases. There are 400,000 people looking for jobs in Quebec, Mr. Speaker. We're in the midst of a second wave. And the last thing that we would have wanted is a dispute at that level of government. That's the last thing we want. Why? Because we have to be united in the face of COVID-19. There's no enemy in Quebec. We have to work together. There's no dispute in spite of what the bloc says. The Honourable Member for Joliet. Mr. Speaker, the Premier of Quebec and the provincial premiers are batting, asking for better health funding for this crisis. And if we hear the Liberals speak, asking for health transfers is a mere whim. We're not talking about unnecessary spending. Nothing could be more tangible than this. We're talking about money to hire med medical personnel and to buy necessary equipment. We're talking about getting our money back to take care of our sick people. They've lost focus. We're fighting a virus. This is a health crisis, and nothing is more important than investing in our health. When will they increase health transfers? The Honourable Minister. I agree entirely that we're fighting against a virus, Mr. Speaker, and that is why we've reached our, ha our handout to work together. And by very, the very definition, the bloc will never want to admit that what we're doing is good, because that goes against their main objective. So when will the bloc say, yes, that was good, Odd was doing this well? They'll never say that. It goes against everything they believe in, Mr. Speaker. So what we want to do is work together, hand in hand with the bloc, everyone together to fight COVID-19. Member for Yorkton, Millville. Thank you, Speaker. Our Canadian farmers, ranchers, fishermen and vegetable growers across this country are working hard every day to supply the food that we need and to supply the world. Their time is valuable. Three months after SEBA was announced, they are finally being included. Yet in the midst of harvest, my farmers are waiting three to six hours on the phone, finally having to leave a message and hope and pray that they can get to the line when the call comes back. They cannot get through to a live person person on the SEBA hotline. What is the minister doing right now 
to fix this problem. Full Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for that uh, really important question. And those farmers, uh, entrepreneurs and businesses are e extremely important. Uh, and we are very committed to making sure that they get the support that they need. Uh, the call centre has been um, changed to a temporarily to respond to the many calls that have come in so that they can deal with uh, the answers to get to the questions that those very businesses have asked, those very farmers. And uh, this is an effort to process those questions a lot quicker. And uh, we are working very hard to make sure they get the answers that they need. The Honourable Member for Battleford, Lloyd Minster. Mr. Speaker, Canada's seniors have been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic on all fronts, and the mental health impact of social isolation is immeasurable. We have all heard heartbreaking stories of seniors separated from their loved ones and their communities. For seniors struggling, the throne speech was a disappointment. With nothing more than vague or repeated ideas, it offered them no clear plan to help them through the pandemic and keep them safe. Mr. Speaker, why is the government allowing Canada to fall behind in its response to the pandemic at the expense of our seniors and their mental health? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to congratulate my uh, colleague for her uh, appointment as critic. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be working with her as we move forward on this. We do understand the challenging times that seniors have had and their families, and that this situation has made it easier for vulnerable seniors to be isolated. To better address social isolation among seniors, we're investing, as you know, 20 million in the New Horizons for Seniors program that's providing over 1,000 new projects in communities directly supporting seniors at home. Providing flexibility in the New Horizons for Seniors funding that we provided in January. This has helped over 700 projects to be initiated in communities helping seniors. And that's also helping seniors with their mental health. The Honourable Member for Caribou, Prince George. Throughout the COVID pandemic, Canadians are experiencing increased anxiety and stress. COVID has had a disproportionate and dev devastating impact on the mental health and well-being of Canadian seniors. Left isolated and alone, lockdown restrictions have prevented seniors from seeing their friends and families or even hugging their grandchildren. Mental health is a cornerstone of public health and is critical to our nation's recovery of this pandemic. Yet despite this reality, the Liberal throne speech dedicated precisely two sentences to the issue of mental health. Why? Well, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to continue uh, to talk about what this government has done to support seniors and their mental health and well-being. The throne speech was an excellent throne speech for seniors. And I want to uh, address what we are doing right now to support those seniors. We are doing it through the New Horizons for Seniors program, through the $350 million in community support that has been provided to help seniors get the services and supports, including the mental health support that they need. We also launched a Wellness Together Canada website uh, portal to help seniors access those essential services that they need to stay well and safe. Steps like these go a long way in helping seniors to know that they are not alone. The government's there with them and for them. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Caribou Prince George. The Honourable Member for Caribou Prince George. Uh, oh, sorry, he's already spoken? Oh, he didn't. Okay. I'm sorry. The Honourable Member for Surrey Newton. Madam our government understands the, and, and appreciates the importance of Canada's forest sector. Like many industries, fallout from COVID-19 has hit forestry and its workers hard. The sector is looking for collaborate strategies to ensure our forest sector is resilient and emerges stronger than ever. During this National Forest Week, could the Minister update this House how our government is supporting the women and men of our forestry sector? The Honourable Minister. 
Well, uh, thank you very much to the member from Surrey Newton. National Forest Week is an opportunity to highlight all of the incredible contributions the forest sector makes to our economy. Throughout this crisis, our government and the forest industry have stepped up to help fight COVID-19 on many fronts. Companies like West Fraser and Canfor have donated much needed N95 masks. FP Innovations is developing biodegradable masks that are made of wood fiber. Additionally, in the midst of the global pandemic, our government provided $30 million to the forest sector so that businesses could safely continue operations during COVID-19. The challenges are immense, but so are the opportunities, and this industry is stepping up to the task. For Bow River. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This government's thrown speech rehashed old Liberal promises without even mentioning oil and gas workers or pipelines. The natural resource sector lost 43,000 jobs in the last quarter alone. Western Canadians have been hard hit by the economic calamity which began under this government long before the pandemic, Bill 69 and 48. The PM is divisive, just like his father. Why won't this government show it cares about national unity and a real economic recovery by supporting our oil and gas workers. The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. At one point, almost one in three workers in mining, oil and gas was able to stay in their job thanks to the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. And the speech from the throne announced this subsidy will continue, Madam Speaker, through and until next summer. This represents hundreds of millions of dollars to support energy sector workers. It also represents, Madam Speaker, tens of thousands of workers who will stay in their jobs in Alberta and Saskatchewan and in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, thanks to this Liberal government. We are supporting workers, we're supporting families and we're supporting their oil and gas sector. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Madam Speaker, Albertans are tired of being ignored by this government. Our energy sector supports 800,000 jobs and it produces 20% of Government of Canada's revenues. Alberta should be a part of this nation's economic recovery. But you can imagine the disappointment. Honourable Member for West Nova. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. We all know that the aviation industry has been hard hurt by the global pandemic. That we now hear that, here that NAV Canada is cutting 14% of its workforce, losing another 720 jobs. They're being laid off and closing two flight information centres, including uh, one in Halifax. The Minister of Transport promised months ago that the government would be supporting the aviation industry, but we're still waiting for their plan. Could the Minister of Transport tell me how many people will be losing their jobs in Halifax, and what is their plan and timeline for reopening? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, we realize that the aviation sector has been hard hit, not only the airlines and the airports, but also uh, NAVCAN, an organization responsible for air traffic control in our country. This is a complex situation which we're looking at very closely because we want to ensure that when we pull out of this pandemic that the air sector is going to be able to resume its operations. and. Uh, I can assure you that uh, we are looking at, in detail at what measures can be put in place to make sure that this happens. The Honourable Member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Today we celebrate Franco Ontarian Day. More than 600,000 Francophones throughout Ontario celebrate this day. September 25th is a day when we can not only celebrate our wins, but also reflect on the future of our community. Can the minister tell this House what measures our government has taken to support francophones in minority settings? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You yourself are Franco-Ontarian, so happy Franco-Ontarian Day. The 600 Franco-Ontarios are always there to defend their rights and to work and live in French in Ontario. We've made historical investments with our official languages plan and in terms of the Canada Census and in terms of the first Franco-Ontario uh, university for, run by and for Franco-Ontarians. We are there for Franco-Ontarians and happy Franco-Ontarian Day. For North Island, Powell River. <laughs> Madam Speaker. Over 40,000 veterans in Canada are on a wait list for benefits that they are owed. Some have waited months, some have waited well over a year. How many times were they mentioned in the speech from the throne? Zero. 
Now veterans are reaching out to my office because they have applied for CERB and they are hoping that they are eligible because they simply have nothing else. Can this government finally take some action quickly for these veterans? They stepped up for all of us as Canadians. When will this government step up for them? Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Uh, merci, uh, Madame. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Of course, the Parliamentary Secretary is going to answer this question. For the question, the throne speech laid out the plan, our government's plan to fight the pandemic and support Canadians. Of course, that means supporting veterans. We know that veterans experience homelessness and investing in ending chronic homelessness for veterans is very important. We know that some veterans are unemployed. Investing in job creation and creating over a million jobs will help veteran, veterans. And let's not forget, just a few months ago, we invested over uh, approximately $200 million. Unfortunately, the time is up. The Honourable Member for Vancouver Granville. Thank you. We've heard the speech from the throne. A lot contained therein. A lot of repeated promises, short on details. With respect to the justice system, we all know that black Canadians and Indigenous peoples are overrepresented. Evidence shows, including through this government's own reports, surveys and extensive consultation, that reforms to mandatory minimum penalties will have a significant impact on these numbers. Specifically, what measures are being referred to in the speech when it says the government will introduce legislation and make investments that take action to address, quote, diversion and sentencing, and what is the timeline? Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for her question as well as her, her dedication to the, the, uh, the, 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 frank, the frankly, Madam Speaker, uh, embarrassing issue of overrepresentation of both black and Indigenous peoples in our criminal justice system. Madam Speaker, as we've said in the throne speech, we are looking at a variety of different measures, uh, analyzing on best evidence how to move those files forward. It is shameful, Madam Speaker, that, that this overrepresentation exists in our criminal justice system, and we are going to, as a government, do our best to remedy it. Uh, unfortunately, that's it for uh, question period.